had just talked about different aspects of um, visual recognition. The next area we're going to move into is talking about depth perception. That's how we're able to determine or see in three dimensions. Um, the key question here is how are, does our brain create a three-dimensional representation from a two-dimensional retina? And while the retina is a curved surface, certainly not three-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. So there are two primary ways in which we perceive depth. The first of these is uh, our what we call binocular cues, and they're called binocular cues because they require the use of both eyes. The primary way most of us see in depth is through a process called retinal disparity, or what's oftentimes called binocular disparity. And what happens is <coughs> images fall on different parts of each retina, and the brain uses that disparity or that difference between the two retinas to determine how close or far away something is. So we, our visual cortex is developed such that we can uh, use that information as a way in which to determine depth. <coughs> Most of us, you know, 90 to 95% of us are able to see depth in this way. Not everyone can. In fact, a lot of people don't have this ability because they have what's called stereo blindness. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But essentially, this is the way this works. And I don't get real wound up in the details of all this. I just wanted to show you an example. We talk in uh, visual science about fixation points, which is basically like wherever it is that you're looking. So, you know, whenever your doctor says, please follow my finger, you know, or a light. You guys have all done that at the doctor's office. Um, that's your fixation point. At that point, um, wherever you're fixating, those are falling on essentially both parts of, uh, the same parts of each retina. But then other things that are outside of this, what we call horopter, are, uh, have very different distances in terms of where they are on each retina. And that difference in those distances are what allow uh, the brain to infer depth. In fact, as we're developing, we get uh, what are called um, ocular dominance columns. And those start to develop in the first couple of years of life, usually about prior to age 25 months or so. As a result, people who have either amblyopia or strabismus, and amblyopia is lazy eye, and strabismus is people who are cross-eyed, uh, during this critical development period generally cannot perceive depth using binocular disparity because they don't have the appropriate ocular dominance columns established. And if they do, they're not lined up correctly. So it's important to get uh, these issues treated in uh, infants so that they can develop um, stereo stereopsis appropriately. So again, it's about 5 to 10% of the population. <coughs> um, now they not exactly disabling. Um, people who are stereo blind uh, will probably never be particularly great athletes because catching a ball is a very important 3D task. Um, amblyopia is relatively easy to treat for infants. They just put prism uh, goggles on the infant so that it shifts where their vision is so that they, it just simply strengthens the muscles uh, in those in that eye. Strabismus usually, I think, requires surgery uh, to get the uh, eyes lined up. It's a really minor, minor issue. Um, <coughs> actually, I have a good friend who's uh, had lazy eye as a kid. They didn't fix it until far later, he's, so he's very stereo blind. Um, but he also, <laughs> that lazy eye comes back after about drink number four or five. Um, <laughs> so whenever you're out with the gym, you look over and that eye's wandered off, you're like, oh, he's drunk again. Um, <laughs> I'm over here if you can't figure out where that eye's gone. But it does, just all of a sudden wanders off. Pretty funny. It's all right, he knows I make fun of him about it. Um, there's a really interesting case study um, of a neuroscientist in Indi at the University of Indiana, I want to say. Uh, she's actually written a book about it, uh, where she uh, was stereo blind and then as an adult trained, basically trained herself, her eyes, to start to see 
um, in stereo. And so she actually was able to correct this. I can't exactly explain how she did it, and it was a long process. So it's not necessarily that this is permanent. Um, and does kind of go against the idea that this is necessarily um, a absolutely critical period for this to develop. But it did take a long time for her to train her eyes to do that. So um, applications of this kind of uh, three-dimensional cue. Uh, these magic eye posters were very popular for a period of time. Um, anyone have any experience with these? You were supposed to, yeah, they were very, it was a big deal about, I don't know, 10 years ago or so, 10, 15 years ago. There were all these magic eye books, posters, calendars, and so you kind of had to blur your eyes to get this three-dimensional image out of this. I was never very good at it. Um, when I was a kid, the Viewmaster was, of course, the that was so exciting to sit and look at static pictures of <laughs> places you've never been. Um, I don't know. I actually have a, the woman who taught me uh, sensation of perception collects um, these kind of uh, view masters. I actually go back um, to sort of the, origin, the origins of photography. Um, the older ones are uh, sort of on the sliding uh, mechanism. <coughs> 3D movies that also um, use uh, retinal disparity to create that illusion of depth. Uh, the old, the old, old 3D movies um, where you had a red and a blue lens in your glasses, those were used to filter out one version of the movie versus the other. So one, one eye saw one projection and the other saw eye saw the other projection. That's what modern ones do. They're polarized in a different way. So there's two movies being presented at the same time that are overlapping. And those goggles then are there to filter out each movie to each individual eye, and that's what creates that illusion of depth. Uh, it's pretty remarkable <coughs> in the way that's done. <coughs> we also are able to infer depth through what are called monocular cues, because they only require one eye. These are also oftentimes called pictorial cues, because these are depth cues that can be put into pictures. Uh, and this is something they teach in art schools about how to create this kind of depth in paintings. In fact, there's a whole, there's a whole sort of era of art on tricking the eye and creating these depth illusions that are pretty remarkable. In fact, next year, I think the Freer Gallery is doing uh, an entire display on um, the sort of art and science of depth. So look out for that. Um, I think the department's going to try to get involved with that in a bit. I need to email the director. So these are some of the ways in which uh, you can create the illusion of depth. The simplest is occlusion. Um, and that just simply is that if something is in front of something else, you can't see what's behind them, so you know that's in front of them, right? <laughs> it's that easy. Um, you know, if somebody is standing in front of something you want to see, they're occluding what you're looking for, and you know that they're between you and whatever you're interested in looking at. So, in this very simple example, whatever this thing is that I found in some clip art file 20 years ago, uh, <laughs> is in front of these buildings. So it gives you an idea about relative distance. That is, one thing is in front of the other. That's about it. Again, you can sort of you know, play around with this kind of thing, but this creates this idea of depth just by simply overlapping shapes. Relative size and field is a very important cue for depth as things move away from us. They take up less room on our retina. Uh, we call it visual angle. And so that's an important cue for depth as well. So in this particular case, this homer looks like he's further away than this one. Obviously, you assume these are all the same height. So it creates this illusion of depth by that sort of relative size. And again, this is the kind of depth cue we learn very quickly. As people, as things move away from us, they get smaller and smaller. As they come towards us, they get bigger and bigger. <coughs> height in the field of view. The closer an object is to a, an, a horizon line, uh, the farther away it appears. One of these cues that artists use often in creating depth, most 
you know, landscape paintings always have some kind of horizon line and things that are in front of it or closer to it look closer versus further away. So this isn't a particularly great example, um, but if we do something relatively simple, like put in an artificial horizon, we create this sense of depth because this homer is closer to this horizon line than this one. Very important cue for depth has to do with lighting and shadow. All of these monocular and pictorial depth cues are created because of our experience. That is, we understand our world and process depth because of our experience with the world. Uh, one of the things we tend to assume is that lighting comes from above. The sun's usually above us. We live in sort of overhead lighting. It's very often that light comes from beneath. It doesn't it does happen, but not as often. So we tend to assume that lighting is from above to cast shadows. Um, it's actually really hard to see. There's actually a shadow here. Let's see if I can. Yeah, still very hard to see. Well, there's a shadow there, I promise you. This is a better example. So what looks just like a circle by doing nothing but altering sort of lighting and shadow, we can make this a three-dimensional object. This is, you know, people who are interested in computer graphics, trying to design, you know, accurate 3D representations. Lighting and shadow is a critical part of this. So you go from a two-dimensional circle to a three-dimensional sphere simply by changing lighting and shadow. So it's a really, really uh, important way to create this kind of depth illusion. I, um, several years ago, got about 10 years ago or so, it's longer ago than that, um, the National Gallery had a show on um, this era of painting called uh, Trump de Wild, which is um, Trick the Eye, it's French for Trick the Eye. And there were all these paintings that were basically designed to try to trick your eye, and one of them, the lighting shadow was incredible. The trick was there was a fly painted on the canvas that I literally, because it was so detailed and the light and shadow was so perfect, I had to go look sideways at it to convince myself there wasn't actually a fly on the canvas. It was really remarkable. So this is a really powerful way to get this kind of depth illusion. Atmospheric effects. Um, the farther away an object is, it tends to be a little bit hazier. Um, we associate sort of haze with distance. And the further things are away in our environment, they tend to look more blue. This is why mountains look blue from far away. Anyone ever been to Colorado, Rocky Mountains? Yeah, the mountains all look blue from the plains. And you get up to them and you're like, nothing up here is blue. Nothing. Um, <laughs> this is actually it's the same reason the sky is blue. It's a phenomenon called Raleigh scatter. Uh, and it's simply that short wavelength light is less likely to get dispersed by the time it reaches your retina. So the reason the sky is blue has to do with the fact that the short wavelength light is what's reaching your eye. Same thing with the mountains. That is, that short wavelength light that is bluer is what reaches your eye. Everything else gets scattered. <coughs> the classic way in which we create depth, which you guys probably all learned how to do sometime around you know, second grade. In art class is linear perspective. Simply the greater the distance, the greater the convergence of lines. So this is pretty simple. We have a you know, two lane road. The further away it is, these two parallel lines converge. We'll take a look at how some of these combine together to create some illusions, but linear perspective is a, a pretty easy one uh, to get a handle on. And again, the reason why we know these, for, uh, the reason they provide us with depth cues has to do with our experience um, and how we travel through the world. And so we've learned over time to recognize these as cues for depth. Familiar size is another important part of this. Our interpretation of an object's size will be guided by our knowledge about the object. So size and distance have a relationship with one another. 
<coughs> so our assumptions about how far away something is or how big something is, all of these are important uh, aspects. And this gets really difficult. <laughs> One of the most difficult things uh, about size and depth perception is when you don't have very good depth cues to try to figure out how far away something is or how big something is. So if you're ever out at the beach trying to figure out sort of how large or how far away a ship is, it's often really difficult, right? Because you really can't, you have no idea how far away something is. So it's either a little boat that's very close or a giant boat that's very far away. And we kind of had that experience that I'm talking about. Uh, same thing when you're flying, right? You're looking out the window, trying to figure out what's below you, and you have really no idea how far away things are, how you know what size things are. Um, it's really hard to make these kind of judgments. Um, so this is sort of a you know size illusion. This is the same. These two people are the same size. It looks tiny here because it's close here, but this is how far away, same size they should be. So it kind of creates these kind of weird illusions. Uh, Epstein did this very classic study where he asked participants uh, which object was closest or farther away. I've never figured out why this half dollar keeps slipping back and forth. Um, but basically they looked at a dime, quarter, and a half dollar, you know, back when people still carried cash. Um, and people, of course, thought the dime was closest because, you know, it should be, if these are all the same distance, the dime should be smaller. The 50-cent um, piece should be larger. So the 50-cent piece was thought to be further away, and the dime was thought to be closest. Uh, another very interesting uh, depth cue is what's called motion parallax. As you're moving through the world, closer objects appear to move faster than farther objects, and they tend to look like they're moving in different directions. So as you're I'm assuming this guy's on a train. Uh, why it's going down the middle of the street, I'm not sure. Um, but things that are very close are moving by in this direction, whereas things that are further away appear to be traveling in the same direction as you are because they're further away. That's why it's called motion parallax. Um, also tells you a little bit about speed. So for example, things that are very close to you will appear to move by very quickly, whereas things that are further away will appear to be moving much more slowly, and again, in different directions. Um, very simple application of this is uh, if you're someone that's used to riding in a truck uh, that's fairly far off the ground, and you get into somebody's car, it feels like you're moving much faster. Um, <laughs> I have a friend that's an over-the-road truck driver and years ago, I went to pick him up somewhere, and he was like, are we going super fast? I was like, no, it's simply that we are much closer to the ground. Um, I actually borrowed a friend's car. It was <laughs> a long time ago, it was a Geostorm. I know. Um, <laughs> wasn't mine. Uh, but it was like this far off the ground. And it was the most terrifying car in the world to drive because I felt like I was in a, like a luge. Because basically, you're driving along like this, very close to the ground. That's motion parallax. Things seem to be moving much faster the closer you are to the ground. Whereas if you're used to being high up in a truck or an SUV, things kind of move by, appear to move by much more slowly because when you're in a sports car very close to the ground, things appear to move much faster. So sometimes our expectations about size and distance, can, or, or about distance, can produce illusions of size, or the two sort of change in uh, very different ways. So size and distance perception um, have a, a relate sort of a relationship together. So this is really cool um, thing called the Ames Room. And there's a number of museums that have these. Anyone ever seen one of these in a museum? Yeah, there's a couple of them around. It tends to look more like this. This is sort of the original Ames room. So, you know, basically you can actually, in this videos, you can see these, you can go into YouTube and watch them. But as this child walks over here, it looks like they grow. And it looks like this is a giant child and small child. Well, what's really happening in the Ames room is the way it's shaped. So we expect 
So you're looking through this window and you expect this room to be square, right? You also expect these tiles to all be square, the windows to be the same size, these walls to be the same size. But in actuality, these walls are much shorter than these walls. The, even the windows change size. Um, all of this is basically built like some crazy three-dimensional trapezoid. So it creates this illusion that as this child walks from one end to the other, they get bigger and bigger and bigger. <coughs> that has to do with our belief about distance. Because again, our assumption is this looks like it ought to be a square room. The Ponzo illusion is another of these. This is actually one I showed you the first day of class, where this line looks to be shorter than that one. That's because this one's closer and that one's further away. But in actuality, they're the same length. Other versions of the Ponzo illusion, these are the same length. The monsters, did I show you guys the monsters in the first day? These guys are actually the same size, too. And as soon as you reinstate the context, the size illusion goes back. So it looks like this monster is much bigger than this one, when in actuality, they're the exact same size. The final version of this sort of size and depth illusion is what's called the moon illusion. Uh, we actually... <laughs> Whenever the, particularly whenever there's a full moon, we fall prey to this illusion that the moon looks bigger when it's closer to the horizon than it does when it's at its apex. When in actuality, it's the same size the whole time. And it's taking up the same amount of space on our retina. It's the exact same size. It's making this trajectory, this is the actual shape of the sky. But our belief is that the sky is shaped this way and so we see this moon here at this size and then here at this size, when in actuality it's really the same size all the way around. So it simply looks bigger. The other difference is particularly um, where there is something between us and the moon, the moon definitely looks a lot bigger. So when the moon's rising up between buildings, for example, it looks a lot larger or up through trees all of that because it provides this kind of depth information. So, you know, it's another example of this compared to here. So the registered path is here when the actual path is here. Any questions about that? About depth perception? I want to move in to talk a little bit about motion perception. Uh, this is a part of the wear pathway in the brain. Most of the motion we perceive is because something moves across the retina from one visual field uh, to the next. That's how you know, real movement looks to us, things move across the retina. But we actually can create um, the illusion of motion by rapid presentation of stimuli. In fact, that's what mo those motion pictures we're so fond of uh, were originally created by this stroboscopic movement. That is, this rapid presentation of successive still images creates the illusion of motion. <coughs> so by simply rapidly presenting um, images that ch change slightly, you get this illusion of movement. That's how animation works, claymation, all of that. Other phenomenon is interesting, particularly, you know, if you're somebody who likes flashy moving Christmas lights or Vegas, this is called the fee phenomenon, where you can get this illusion of movement. Right? That looks like it was moving. In actuality, those were a series of successive still images. That's how moving lights work, right? So when you get these marquee lights that look like the lights are traveling around, it's just lights are lighting up one at a time and it looks like they're traveling. That's the fee phenomenon. So rapidly presenting two lights at close locations um, will result in the perception of movement. And so 
those kind of, you know, marquee lights, you know, the light appears to move from one location to the next. There are some rare instances of patients who cannot perceive motion. Uh, they have what's called motion blindness, or what is known as akinetopsia. This usually this is always due to area MT in the dorsal visual stream. Very rare disorder, only a couple of known documented cases. Really fascinating though, uh, one patient, uh, <laughs> the way this got diagnosed is she called a plumber because the water coming out of her faucet was frozen. She couldn't see it moving. And so it looked like a solid stream of ice to her because the water wasn't flowing. Um, another case, a guy developed a sudden, fairly severe phobia of dogs. Just he would be out uh, and dogs would suddenly appear because you wouldn't see them walk up to them. They would just appear out of nowhere. So these people live literally in series of still images. So they don't see anything coming towards them or away from them. Impossible to do things like filling, pouring a glass of milk. They can't do it because they can't see the glass filling. The, the glass is empty, then it's full or it's overflowing. So they don't see motion at all. Pretty debilitating, but also very rare. I won't show you the motion after effect. We actually did that, um, I guess, last time. Here's a link to it again as well. I know if you want to amaze your friends and roommates. I want to turn now and talk a little bit about uh, some applied aspects of perception. I'm actually going to do these. Uh, we'll start with inattentional blindness, and we'll talk about change blindness. Inattentional blindness is a failure to perceive objects that are not the focus of our attention. This is called the monkey business illusion. See the gorilla? So what's happening here? Hey, thanks, Dan. We're, hey, Dan, we're done. Shut it. <laughs> we're going to get back to Dan Simon in a minute. Um, so that's inattentional blindness. It's this failure to perceive objects that are not the focus of attention. Uh, the first version of this is done by Ulrich Neisser. Um, and actually, it's in some ways a little bit better because it's a lot harder task. Uh, and what Nicer did is he actually filmed two groups of players passing balls and then superimposed the films on one another. So they're kind of ghosty and they're really, it's really much more perceptually difficult. And then a girl just walks through with an umbrella. Um, and the first time I uh, was shown that, I didn't see the girl with the umbrella and I was absolutely convinced there was no way a girl with an umbrella had walked through the middle of that, those <laughs> players. Um, the problem with this inattentional blindness is when you're focused on one thing, you don't know that you're not focusing on other things. So from an applied perspective, 
this is a really important consideration. There is um, are so, uh, some car manufacturers have opted to start putting in heads-up displays where they project information on the on your windshield, so that theoretically you don't have to look down to see how fast you're going. The problem with those is is that you might be focused on looking at the speedometer that's on your windshield and not notice realize that you aren't seeing things that are right behind them, that is, things that are on the road. So in some experiments um, with airline pilots and heads-up displays um, <coughs> in cockpit simulators, they discovered that if they put heads up or information sort of in this kind of heads up display, uh, pilots were much more likely to land on top of another plane because they were focused on the instruments and didn't realize they weren't looking at the runway. The, the difference is when you have to look down at gauges, you know you're not looking at the car, you know, at the road in front of you, or in this case, the runway. Whereas with the heads up information, you assume that because you're looking that direction, you can see everything. So it's one of the reasons why these kinds of head, heads up displays are probably not that good of an idea. Now some of them are. Some Mercedes and Ford have are trying to develop sort of augmented visual systems so that if it's foggy, the heads up display will show you where the road is. I'm assuming it figures out where the road is better than you do. Um, <laughs> that seems like a probably good idea. Or others, uh, I don't know if you've seen these, uh, will flash a warning like in your windshield if you're about to hit something. That's something I could use. Um, <laughs> my car beeps at me if I'm about to run into something, and that saved me from more things than I can tell you. So but let's look at change blindness. This is another aspect of the same thing. Also, Dan Simon. Thank <laughs> you. 
that's um, change blindness. While we are here, sorry. Um, quick discussion. Wanted you to provide an example where you may have experienced this kind of inattentional blindness that doesn't involve monkeys or <laughs> changing. You know, sometime in your life, you could think of a time where you, this might have happened, or you know, an example of where this might happen. Just kind of think about it for a minute. Card trick one. Um, that's a good one. I actually have an example from that. Anyone ever seen this card trick on Facebook where it, they show you like four cards and then they're magically going to take one card away and what they do is they switch all their cards? Chris Angel. Sorry, did I miss something really funny? Um, how many of you have had somebody get mad at you because you didn't see them? Yeah. Like, dude, I saw you the other day. I'm like, that's an intentional blindness. It's I mean, you know, that happens all the time, particularly if you don't expect somebody somewhere. Um, oh, <laughs> see? <laughs> oh, I've had this happen all the time, where you'll be sitting somewhere, and I'm like, where did they go? <laughs> you know what had that happen to? Like, wasn't there just somebody right here? Or somebody just appears next to you, like, where did you come from? Um... You know, this kind of thing happens all the time. I don't know if you've ever been either walking or driving somewhere and had to turn with somebody and say, has that been there the whole time? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> like, has this been here, like, all the time? Because you just haven't paid attention to it. That's, this is what we're talking about. So we all have this kind of experience um, at a variety of different, you know, points in our lives. All right. So let's move on to talking about the auditory system and hearing. Um, much like with the visual system, we'll talk first about the stimulus. So with auditory system, stimulus is light particles and light waves. Uh, for uh, the auditory system, it's sound waves. Sound waves are actually mechanical energy propagating through the air. They're essentially local pressure changes. Similarly with uh, light, we have two physical properties of sound waves that are related to perceptual attributes. So the amplitude of a sound wave is related to its loudness. So the larger or the higher a wave is, the louder it sounds to us. Much like with um, light, we talked about light. We talked about wavelength being associated with um, perception of hue. In um, sound, we talk about frequency. They're really the same thing. So a low-frequency sound is going to have a longer wavelength than a high-frequency sound. And frequency simply has to do with cycles per second. So we measure frequency of sound in hertz, which is just simply cycles per second. The reason we talk about frequency and not wavelength is light always travels at 186,000 meters per second. Sound, it depends on temperature, pressure, all sorts of local conditions. And so we talk about how frequently a sound wave is striking your ear as the important physical property. So shorter wavelengths, or 
<laughs> which is higher frequency, um, are higher sounds, lower frequency sounds, longer wavelengths uh, are um, lower frequency, sort of lower uh, sounds. One of the things that's important to understand about um, loudness and pitch is the two are not completely independent. That is, we hear some pitches much better than others, uh, and some will sound, even though that they are of the same amplitude, they won't sound the same loudness. You can actually create what are called equal loudness curves, I have some in here, in which you can see how, what amplitude of a sound will make it seem as loud depending on its frequency. Our ears are designed to hear human voices. Uh, that's the sort of range of sounds we hear best. We don't hear real low frequency sounds well, we don't hear real high frequency sounds well, we hear these sort of middle frequency sounds much better. So, again, frequency corresponds to our perception of pitch, amplitude, or loudness. Complexity, whether it's a simple tone or a complex tone, which is a mix of frequency, has to do with the perceptual property of timbre. Um, <coughs> we won't spend much time on this. Um, there's a whole science behind understanding complex tones and ha our perception of complex tones um, and understanding things like fundamental frequencies. We won't get that in depth here, but these are the perceptual properties of sound waves. <coughs> We're going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the anatomy of the ear, much like we did with the eye. The ear's got some really fascinating properties. Uh, we started in the exterior with the pinna, just this part, you know, out here. Um, sound gets funneled in by the pinna, then goes through the auditory canal, ending at the tympanic membrane or the eardrum that then vibrates based on those sound waves. This um, auditory canal acts as a resonance chamber, so it actually boosts certain frequencies uh, more than others, so it allows us to hear some things. A tympanic membrane then, membrane then vibrates, um, causing the uh, three uh, ossicles, which are the three little bones of the inner ear or the middle ear, uh, to move back and forth. That then propagates those sound waves into um, the inner ear, into the cochlea, this fluid-filled snail-like structure here. That fluid then moves. Those sound waves travel through that fluid, and that's what causes our perception. So, taking these one at a time, the pinna, its primary function is protecting the ear, uh, allows us to localize sound better, and funnels sound into the auditory canal. The pinna is important for allowing us to localize certain frequencies of sound by letting us know whether it's in front of or behind us. <coughs> so it's an important localization tool. Um, some animals, Horses, dog, some dogs, like uh, my corgi, Peanut, uh, they have movable pinna, and so she actually, if she's walking with me, she has one ear in front and one ear in back, so she can hear both directions. Uh, it's pretty funny. You can also sort of see her, <laughs> like she'll, she'll just all of a sudden go, whoop, like she just hears something, like a little radar gum. Um, but they're really good at localizing sound and finding sounds that way. Um, the auditory canal then acts as a resonance cha chamber to boost certain frequencies. You know, this is that thing you jam a Q-tip into even though you're not supposed to. Um, I know you do, right? Everybody does. Um, you know, you're not supposed to stick anything in there that's smaller than your elbow, but let's face it, sometimes you just gotta get some gunk out. Um, <laughs> so this acts as a resonance uh, chamber, allowing to boost certain frequencies. So then we arrive at the tympanic membrane, or the eardrum. The tympanic membrane propagates sound waves into the middle ear. <coughs> so this is all considered the outer ear. Everything, the pinna, uh, auditory canal, and the tympanic membrane. Once we get past that, we then go on to the middle ear. The middle ear is what happens when your head gets all stuffy and you can't hear anything or you get an ear infection, that's all happening 
this part. Um, these eustachian tubes are what allow fluid to drain out of here and when you get all stuffy or get an ear infection, that's all happening in there. Um, one of the things that can happen um, due to this kind of you know, buildup of fluid is you can actually end up rupturing your eardrum. I had that happen. I can tell you it's unpleasant. Um, actually, my left ear, you guys will eventually learn that I'm basically made up of spare parts. Um, my left ear, I had surgery on my left ear three times when I was a kid, and the tympanic membrane is actually a graft, and I actually have uh, prosthetic ossicles. They were actually replaced with ceramics uh, when I was in about third grade. Um, anyway, I had a really bad sinus infection and then went to a very loud concert. Uh, went to the see the violent thumbs at backstage, pa backstage passes. Went to that and then went to work at a nightclub, um, working the bar on the dance floor. And so basically for 10 hours, I was assaulted by very loud music. And I woke up the next day, blood running out of my ear. I'm like, oh, that's nice. Um, Fortunately, it just healed, but now whenever I go to the doctor, I mean, it was already kind of scarred anyway from the surgery I'd had, but now they look at it and they're like, oh my God. <laughs> so every time I go to a new doctor, I'm like, when you look in the left ear, it's pretty jacked up. Um, so don't be startled. Uh, so that gets us to the middle ear. The ossicles, which are the little bones, still have not fixed this. Move backwards. how I screwed this up. I've done this a number of times. Every time I'm teaching this lecture, I realize that this is broken and that I fix it on here and then never for remember to save it on my computer. The incus, the malleus, and the stapes are the anvil, hammer, and stirrup. Um, malleus means mallet, which is why that's the hammer. <coughs> you know, they generally look like um, what they say, their primary function is sound conduction, so conducting sound from the tympanic membrane into the inner ear, and amplification. In fact, a big part of their function is sound amplification. They actually function as levers. So you should probably know from physics that when you have a lever, you increase the amount of force at the other end of the lever, right? This is why people use pry bars and that sort of thing. Well, that's what's happening with these little bones. They actually function as levers, and they, ma they physically increase the amount of force going from the tympanic membrane into the cochlea. So they actually increase, they're like a force multiplier. This is what goes awry um, as people get older. They get osteoarthritis in the bones, the bones themselves start to get brittle or break, and so they get what's called conduction hearing loss or conductive hearing loss. These are, it's easily remedi remedi remediable with hearing aids. The reason why older adults need hearing aids is simply because these bones are no longer providing the amplification they need because they no longer act as a lever, and so that's what hearing aids are doing is they're actually sort of replacing that function. Um, it's also why if you get you know, really bad stuffy head while you can't hear anything because essentially that fluid is keeping those bones from moving like they're supposed to. That's why everything sounds kind of fuzzy. So they are quite tiny. Um, this is actually what they look like. Um, these are itty bitty little bones. So the last point in the middle ear is the oval window. This is where the stapes foot plate pushes the oval window to conduct sound into the fluid of the inner ear. So that stapes foot plate moves back and forth with sound, moving those sound waves or propagating those sound waves into the fluid-filled cochlea. It causes that fluid then to move. And the movement of that fluid is then what creates our perception of sound. 
questions about this so far? Really a lot of steps involved in getting sound just into the cochlea itself. So the inner ear then has four major components I want to talk about. The cochlea, inside the cochlea is the basal, basal membrane. These are involved in our perception of sound. The semicircular canals we'll talk more about here in a bit or um, next Wednesday, depending on what we get through. Semicircular canals are involved in our um, balance and orienting system. It's called the vestibular system. Um, so when you have an inner ear infection, uh, people oftentimes have balance problems it's because the semicircular canals are having trouble. And then finally, the auditory nerve is just simply where all this inflammation exits the ear. So we'll start with the cochlea. The cochlea is this fluid-filled tube that curls into a snail-like shape and contains the basilar membrane. So here's that stapes foot plate pushing on the oval window that causes these sound waves to propagate across the basilar membrane. And then that pressure leaves via the round window. So the sound waves travel across the basilar membrane and then exit. What you can see, uh, a couple of things to note is uh, the basilar membrane uh, starts out very wide and then gets very narrow. As a result, sound waves will displace different parts of this membrane based on their frequency. So some frequency sounds will displace at the base where others will displace at the apex. And as a result, where along this basilar membrane uh, sound waves are having their maximal effect will depend on our perception of sound. So on the basilar membrane are hair cells. This is where sound waves get transduced. So transduction occurs uh, via the hair cells. As the hair cells are bending back and forth, they're generating action potentials. So as the fluid moves across the basilar membrane, uh, this causes the hair cells to bend. The bending of the hair cells generates an action potential. This is how everything we hear gets accomplished by uh, this process of these bending of hair cells. Now, we're going to talk here in a minute about how we code for frequency of sound. So one of the problems we have is lower frequency sounds can get coded by how often those hair cells bend, right? So each time a hair cell bends, that's a sound wave. So you can use that to determine what frequency of sound is. We've got to go back to first principles, though. Any given neuron can only fire up to 1,000 times a second at most. We can hear 5,000 hertz tone, 6,000 hertz tone. So not all the sounds we can hear can be created by the frequency of hair cells firing action potential. So we have to figure out how the ear is accomplishing our perception of higher frequency sounds because they are outside the ability of a hair cell to do that on its own. <coughs> Again, we'll revisit that idea here in a minute. Semicircular canals, we'll talk about more in a minute. In a bit, this is the vestibular system. Um, so it's this fluid filled organ which provides our 3D orientation information. This just tells us sort of where we are and three dimensions. This is the part of uh, our perceptual system that is generally responsible for motion sickness, particularly seasickness. Uh, anyone who's had the bed spins after a night when you were drinking when you weren't supposed to? Right. You can tell by the laughs that someone else has had this problem. Um, that's the vestibular system. The vestibular system that says, hey, you're spinning around and around. <laughs> uh, because what happens is alcohol changes the way in which the vestibular system works. And so uh, alcohol has a really dramatic effect on the vestibular system. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a bit. So there's one of these in each of the three planes. Uh, there's fluid sort of running around in these. Um, and that's what creates that kind of perception. 
We'll revisit it here in a bit. The auditory nerve is where neurons leave the ear for the thalamus, and then on up to the auditory cortex. Uh, the auditory nerve is where people who have cochlear implants, uh, they tap into the auditory nerve and provide the uh, electrical signals that create the perception of sound for people with, uh, with uh, cochlear implants. So that exits the ear and heads off towards the thalamus uh, to what's called the medial geniculate nucleus or the MGN. So basic summary, sound comes in, gets amplified by the auditory canal, strikes the tympanic membrane, moves the obstacles, causes sound to go through the cochlea, hair cells are bent, action potential is generated, and as a result, we hear sound. So how do we perceive pitch in uh, localized sound? So this is where we get into the more of the perception of sound. Well, we have part of the um, temporal lobes called the primary auditory cortex, this area air one, A1, that contains the primary auditory cortex. Just like the visual system, we have a spatial or where pathway in which auditory features locate the sources of sound. We'll talk more about how that gets accomplished here in a minute. We also have a non-spatial or what pathway in which auditory features locate the temporal aspects of sound, its pitch, um, etc. Timbre that then gets processed further up the auditory pathway and then you know, gets up into our language center so we can recognize spoken sound or spoken language, for example. Um, what's interesting about the auditory cortex is it's laid out in a tonotopic map. Uh, that is basically the auditory cortex is laid out in terms of frequency. So lower frequency sounds are located to the next frequency sound. So it's basically a map of the tonal properties of sound. Uh, which is very similar to the visual cortex. Visual cortex is laid out in a spatial nature. Um, it's an actual map of the uh, external world, whereas the what pathway of the auditory cortex is laid out in terms of the uh, tone or pitch of a sound. And again, it's this tonotopic map. So if you look into the primary auditory cortex here in the temporal lobe, and basically go from low frequency to high frequency in a systematic way. So coding, encoding of sound occurs in two different ways uh, from the basilar membrane. There's place coding and temporal coding. Place coding occurs because the cochlea gets influenced at different locations along the basilar membrane depending on the pitch of a sound. So this is where on the basilar membrane hair cells are being displaced and firing that causes, uh, that results in the code for the pitch of a sound. So understanding the, the pitch of a sound, or where the bleh, perception of a pitch of a sound comes from, uh, is dependent on where along the basilar membrane uh, that is occurring. So low frequency sounds, sounds tend to fire uh, closer to the apex, higher frequency sounds closer to the base. The other way in which um, pitch perception is accomplished is through a temporal code. The cochlea registers lower frequency sounds via the firing rate of action potentials of the hair cells. So each time a hair cell bends, that's a sound wave. And so we can get up to about a thousand hertz uh, out of the temporal code, then the rest of it has to be done via place coding. So lower frequency sounds we can encode via the temporal code. Higher frequency sounds require um, encoding via this place coding and using what's called the volley principle. So basically, it's a, a volley of um, action potentials occurring at certain frequencies and in certain places. So this is how the auditory system is able to encode uh, the frequency of sound information. So the next thing to talk about with the auditory system is localizing sound. Uh, this is very similar to the idea of binocular disparity in vision. Basically, we're using the difference between 
our two ears as a way in which to code where sound is coming from. Sound travels very slowly, and it's around 700 miles an hour, which sounds fast, but you know, from the brain's perspective, it's pretty slow compared to light. Light's you know, 186,000 meters per second. So what's happening is, if you look over here at um, sound B, it's striking the, this person's right ear, the really detailed head. Aren't you guys proud of my drawing? It's pretty, pretty good art. Um, yes, I did this myself. You can tell, right? Um, <laughs> graphic designer I will never be. Um, so anyway, sound B is striking the right ear, and then sometime later it's striking the left ear. That's how we locate where sounds are. It's basically the difference between uh, one sound or the other. When something is directly in front of us or behind us, we can generally tell that because the pinna. Now there are certain frequencies of sound um, that that's not true for, so lower frequency sounds are much harder to localize. And in fact, very low frequency sounds, we can't localize at all. <coughs> and the reason for that has to do with the width of your head, <laughs> literally. Because what happens is, for a very low frequency sound, the sound wave is actually bigger than your head. And so the sound wave will strike one ear at a time. It won't strike both ears. And so you can't localize those sounds because there's no temporal difference from one ear to the next. Um, you can actually, if you're, you know, bored and have nothing to do, you can actually figure out what's the lowest frequency sound you could localize based on the width distance between your ears. We had to do this when I was in graduate school. I don't remember how to do it, but you can do it. Ask somebody else how to do it. It's not very hard. You just basically figure out the speed of sound and what the actual wavelength is, etc. Uh, from an applied perspective, it basically means that bass speakers, particularly subwoofers, can be placed anywhere because you'll never know where the sound's coming from. So, so when you're setting up your home theater system, you can put that subwoofer wherever you'd like because you can't tell where that sound is coming from. Higher frequency sounds are where you have to be much more careful about speaker placement. That's how surround sound works, because higher frequency sounds are where the sort of rear speakers are much more likely to be involved. Okay, um, last couple issues. Um, cochlear implants are relatively new technology, not super new, but certainly much, um, they're much better. Uh, hearing loss has two main causes, conductive hearing loss, this tends to be caused damage to the eardrum or the ossicles. This is what happens as we get older. Uh, or you can have sensory neural hearing loss. And this is loss, uh, usually damage to the cochlea, um, the auditory nerve, or the hair cell. Now, I want to note um, that if you listen to music very loudly, this is the kind of hearing damage you are causing, is sensory neural hearing loss. Because what happens is your hair cells get damaged, uh, very loud, low-frequency sounds can displace large amounts of the basilar membrane, and you can actually end up with permanent hearing loss because of the loss of the hair cells. But cochlear implants are um, for individuals that are generally born with a malfunctioning or non-functioning cochlea. And it's a relatively, it's not that rare of a phenomenon. Um, so infants are, uh, Newborn infants are always hearing tested. Uh, there's a couple of ways to test infant hearing. Uh, one is through what's called the evoked click response. Uh, the other is to do an audi auditory evoked potential as they just stick some electrodes on the uh, infant's skull and then see if they uh, sound activates the auditory cortex. In the event um, that there is damage Early on, they will oftentimes put in cochlear implants. So this helps with that sensory neural hearing loss and assists in normal language development. Uh, because the sooner you can get uh, infants hearing well, the, the more rapidly they will develop language, they will, their language will sound normal, um, they'll be able to mimic sounds. Uh, kids learn language at very young ages, and so uh, this is one of the things that um, is a way in which to assist that. Now, cochlear implants are not without controversy. There are people who um, believe 
are part of the deaf community, uh, that believe it's a culture and a community. And I think I understand that. Um, so it's, it's certainly something that's not without controversy, but it's certainly an option for people who think that that's important. All right. Um, we will finish up with the other senses, starting with uh, the body senses next Wednesday.